Hello, PAX 2020. I have definitely not shot this intro multiple times. Welcome to the couch of FilmJoy. I am Mikey Newman. I uh, make a show called Movies of Mikey on a, a channel called FilmJoy. And speaking of, I am joined by producer of FilmJoy and extraordinary person, Terry Eakin. Hello, it's me. Thank you. Thank you. They're all clapping. I can Everyone hear it. Loves I can me. hear it. Everyone, They're all here for Everyone me. loves me. No, they aren't. Hello. Hi. We're going to, this feels like an episode of Drunk History. Like, it does. I was thinking earlier, like, we should get some cocktails going. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. It's the too early for cocktails. <laughs> anyway, I've been making my show for six years. Used to be at PAX all the time. I did a bunch of movies and Mikey panels yeah. at PAX. Miss you all dearly. How do you think that Movies with Mikey has evolved since the beginning of it? When did it start anyway? 2014 Ninja Turtles 1 was my first video. I wanted to talk about like dumb movies from my childhood and it evolved and I wanted to take it more seriously but it's always been a reflection of me and what I'm going through at the time. Uh, when you when you when you sort of map my life to it it makes a lot of sense. Uh, like in 2017 I went to PAX East and I caught what I thought was the flu. I just literally couldn't move. I had to go to the hospital. My dad actually drove me. Um, but I remember at PAX East, I did a panel and I announced the moon episode. I'm gonna do one quick announcement before questions. The next episode of Movies with Mikey is moon. Yeah, that's a good one. But it's funny when, because I was bedridden for basically two months. Yeah. And I'm like, time to get up and make this episode about how a guy's body is dying out from underneath him. And he's like really, he's really scared and really sad. And I was like, oh. I was here when you were editing some of oh, that. And I remember you doing, yeah. and it was just too sad. I like couldn't. By the way, that that is yeah. so the the ma the mouse is here. I controlled it with the back of my hand because I, yeah. I couldn't. So I would like literally click the mouse like this. That it was funny. I remember finishing that episode, the whole episode. Wherever it was like a hollow. Uh, I remember finishing it and being mad at myself for it being so short. Oh yeah, I remember. It was that. it was like the yeah, biggest miracle did. ever, and I'm like, ah, you oh, doofus! Gosh. You see this very excited show where I'm like, be joyous, just to be joyous, and then you, I think, see me kind of going through this this 2017, 2018 um, tunnel where I was like training myself how to be happy again. I did this episode in 2018 where I was kind of trying to finally put 2017 behind me because um, I dealt with some pretty pretty heavy stuff and I'm I thank you for being on the couch with me because uh, this stuff's hard to talk about yeah. but I I had pretty pretty horrible PTSD um, and I I was I was really just either depressed beyond reason or just sad all the time and it's like okay be happy and uh i did an episode that wasn't really about movies it was an episode of movies of mikey but it was called get off the floor which was like me kind of yelling at myself uh from 2017 but get off the floor was was that moment where i was like michael get off the floor because that moment that happened to me was the creed episode you fight i fight which was like grabbing it at the universe, like, help me get through this. Um, and in 2018, I finally uh, sort of reflected on that time period. For as sad as that episode is, I think the stories are funny and endearing. Anyway, let's get let's get out of the dredges of 2017 yeah. and 2018. Um, well, we should talk about that that transition going from having a full-time job to doing YouTube as your full-time job. YouTube carries with it its own physical and mental stressors. Like when people are giving you feedback on everything you do 100% of the time, every day, every week for years, that 
alone has a mental toll. <laughs> but I think going from having a full-time job with health insurance that I could no longer do to full-time YouTube and trying to run a business and having no idea how to do that and failing miserably and hurting a lot of people I love. I want to be frank there. Uh, sorry. I... You learn a lot when you have to live month to month. But to, to move forward, I think, in the timeline here to last year, yeah. which is a reflection of 2017, I got a letter in the mail from who? Our good, good friends, the IRS. It's so good. So fun. Oh. Uh, what, were they, what were they offering? Uh, they were offering to take a look at your 2017 tax return. Like, wow, that's so kind of them. So I got audited. Yeah. Um, which was cool. Yeah. But like, that was that was pretty scary. Like, that can happen. Yeah. I, can, I went full-time in YouTube and I got really audited as a result of that. To mess up. because Especially in 2017 as a transition year for you because for the first half of the year, you did have a full-time job where your taxes were taken out of your paycheck and all, you know, that's normal. And then at the end of the year, you transition to YouTube full time. Yeah. And being self employed is a lot harder than people think it is. And the taxes yeah. and how to file and all of that is challenging. It was a lot of work to like to get to where we are now. And I think we're in a really healthy place, which is what we want to share with everyone. So what were some of the steps we took sort of post audit? We did take the steps to establish an LLC yeah. in a real company. Um, we paid taxes quarterly for 2019. And moving forward, we have now switched to full-time W-2 status for us. And our Patreon was super helpful because the Patreon yeah. has got us from 2017 to here. Because I was living month to month on a healthy... Very healthy Patreon uh, from 2017 to 2019. Like that was a struggle in and of itself. I think it's it's easy to look at the Patreon income and think like, oh, well, they get to pocket all of that. But yeah, no. you forget things like the production costs of the show. And, you know, when you had a full-time job to supplement that cost. Sure. It was and health insurance. It was and you had health insurance, which, by the way, we do have. We do have health insurance at Film Joy now. We, our health insurance kicked in on April first, twenty twenty, just in time. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> just in time. It it took about six months to get the health insurance set up because there's uh, there's actually a lot of steps that you have to do. You have but to you have can a, do it. That's why yeah, we're here. You can to, do it. it we're can we're be sort done. of bearing our souls yeah. to be like you actually can yeah. see the other side of this. We started a merchandise company. Yes. Our own. So why why do you, why did we do that? I think there was a few reasons why. You you make about a dollar fifty to two dollars per shirt sell on the third party drop shipping companies that handle merch for YouTubers. Right. So we thought if we started our own, if we just did it ourselves, yes. we would feel better about it and we would get a bigger return on it. Some of it was personal connection to the audience itself. Yeah, the extra stuff that we do for shipping, doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. No. And it doesn't take a lot of time either. We actually support local businesses in our local business. Yeah. I don't know, it feels nice. It's just us two. Yeah. I, I find that very rewarding. It makes me feel good about life. Anyway, curveball question. What is your least favorite episode of Movies and Mikey? I have a hard time with The Emperor's New Groove just because of like the time and the place. I, I find watching, and this is just I guess where we differ, I find watching myself broken fine. Like Emperor's New Groove, I'm, I, I talk so fast, but I can't. So it is a little hard to understand. But I'm like, I let myself off the hook for that one. Yeah. I think what does bother me is just the constant, constant, like people accusing me of being drunk, being like, you don't even know how to talk, like all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, there's like, I just yeah. explained this. Another interesting thing that you mentioned to that is, I want to say the 
the la the most recent Star Wars, like a bunch of thoughts about Star Wars. Too many thoughts. Too many Star thoughts yeah, about yeah, Star yeah. Wars. You would started that episode, and then when we went to Vegas, we still had part three to record. But then we got in that car accident. So part three, you're having a hard time and people are like noticing it in the comments. We were still in Vegas the, the morning after the car accident. Yeah. Star Wars episodes, two thirds done. I feel horrible, I'm cranky. Like we're, we're not in the best mood. No. Cause like we're all bruised and bloodied and awful. Cause we, we got it, true fact, <laughs> Apparently, this is the therapy couch, which maybe that's what PAX panels should just be, is therapy that, Maybe couches. that's what PAX Online 2020 Hell be. yeah. Yeah. PAX 2020. I'm here for it. Therapy PAX. I, I just tweeted some shitty, stupid thing where they announced the Mac Pro, like, fully loaded with some just absolutely unreasonable. It was like $30,000. It was $60,000. Yes, oh my gosh. And people were like, just mad at me. Golden rule, never tweet. Always right. true. Then I was feeling like bad about that. And I just, I remember that being like funny. Cause I'm like, if y'all only knew, the, speaking of the Star Wars episode, I think that's where our production value went a lot higher. Cause you, you are pretty rad with makeup. Like we did yeah. full on, we invented a character named Cax Sabulba and I had blackout contacts. And I remember, this is a fun story. Blackout contacts are like this big. And my hand, like at any time, like any, I could not get them in my eye. So me and Tara are in the bathroom and <laughs> she's holding my eye open and I'm like, just be anywhere but here. Uh, and we, she got them in. Yeah. She got full on black, <laughs> but like the makeup in that episode, I was really proud of like, cause what was our budget for that? Like, what did we spend total? Oh, I total? think we spent like, $150. The on contacts it. were like 70. Yeah. Yeah. And then the rest of it was like like the scar was Elmer's glue. Ooh, makeup I'm really proud of that episode. Like yeah. it looks so much more expensive than it is. And I give you the credit there. Oh, thank you. Because you shot it and lit it yeah. and everything. I think it was also towards the end of 2019 was when I think we were really finding our footing for because we were starting to come out of the like month to month problem right, that we right. mentioned before and I think just starting to feel better as people and as creators. Yeah, I think that's what will like you sort of look back at the show, you can see all these sort of turning points. I want to talk about an episode that did not do well originally. It experienced a kind of resurgence algorithmically at one point, the Jarhead episode, which never got views, but I was doing it for me because I wanted to talk about PTSD in an, in an open uh, sort of way. And I reached out to uh, active duty and, and non-active duty service members. The episode actually ends with a quote from one. The episode is about Jarhead, but I talk about this scene in the movie The Hurt Locker and this man has been through just all this horrible stuff in war and all these like huge things. He gets to the cereal aisle and, and it, 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 he, he's stunned. He cannot make a decision. And I was like, that, that right there, I, that, that was something I felt in my soul because it's like you can't just be like, go get a box of cereal because cereal doesn't matter. Like it does not matter at all, especially when your life has been sort of like co-opted by these things and I it took me so long to find a way to like say that and it came down to the hurt locker and cereal people watch my show for a lot of reasons but a lot of time is to sort of help us heal like my show is helping me heal and I, I try to yeah. make it a thing that can help other people find a way to find the the sunlight for lack yeah. of a better term what other episode do you think that you're like most proud of that is an excellent question. Um, uh, the Baby Driver episode is 100% about disability. Because, like, as a disabled person who has been disabled for four years now, like, it, it's every day it's, it's something. Like, how many times have I fallen? Do you ever, before we get there, do you ever get the feeling, like, when I fall around the house, are you ever, like, this is the one... <laughs> The, for me, where I'm like, well, this is the one, it was the one where you fell through the table the other week. Yeah, that was like 
three weeks ago. Yeah, that was the one where I was like, do we need to go to the hospital? Because I thought you broke your that arm. That was a big, that was a big, yeah. It wasn't broken, though. Scar's it, not there anymore. No, it, like, it was, you. I mean, that was, was, that was a full-size yeah. table from Target. Yeah. I mean, it was this tall, kind of had these bowed, it was all wood. It was this yeah. tall, and it was my end table for my, my bed. I spasmed off the bed, and I remember being in flight, but I went through a table, Yeah. completely destroyed it. We have not replaced that table actually yet. It's, it's interesting because you fall so much, it's just become like a common, just day-to-day occurrence. I try not to make a big deal out yeah, of it. Yeah, and I don't really. want to either, because like if I coddle you every single time you like trip, wouldn't that get annoying? Yeah, Every, everybody's like but, fights, I think, are invisible to the outside world. Because yeah. I, I, I've been honest about my struggles, but we've been kind of quiet about it. Because yeah. it's more like learning to live with it. And I think that, to bring it back, I think that's what the Baby Driver episode was to me. Because that, that is a movie. Like, he has a disability. His roommate has a disability. I reached out to my friend and Paxer, Katrina. Uh, Katrina's actually in that episode because she suffers from tinnitus. I was like, this is a movie that could teach you things about disability. So I, I part of that was just kind of reverse engineering them. Um, Cause like being disabled and proud, I think is, it's an interesting journey in and of itself versus disabled and quiet. And I think the disabled community should always be proud and loud. Damn it. Like it's hard. It's hard for us. Mm-hmm. And, like, people mock the shit out of us, like, all the time. It's awful. But that, that to me, is what that, that episode represented and, and was. And also, I got to delete Kevin Spacey from existence, which was also a joy. Yeah. I think we should get to fan questions. I agree. And I have a handy paper here. We've got a couple of questions from fans for you. Apparently, I, can I can't mind good. Our first question is from Martizzle, and he wants to know, why is Shaun of the Dead the greatest movie ever? (laughs) Okay. Uh, Shaun of the Dead is a movie about two people that are in love, they love each other, they don't quite fit together, and the toxicity of their relationship, and constantly trying to get back together and break up, like, that's... It gets their parents killed, it gets all of their best friends killed, it gets their roommates killed, it gets a bunch of other people killed. And I find that so deeply, like, like what a comment on relationships. Like, Shaun of the Dead is literally saying, sometimes these won't work. And it's funny watching the end where they're like, we did it! And I'm like, no, you didn't! You did not do it! You did not do it! Uh, And I think that's why Shaun of the Dead is the best movie ever. This question is from Dr. Wordperson, and she wants to know, what process do you use to look for useful and positive things to say about a film when it's often so much easier to find things to complain about? It feels like a natural process for me because I just think about uh, what a movie means to me, I guess, um, at like the, the lowest level. But a lot of times it's easy to be positive because I can come... I can usually grab any film and talk about it, like what created it, what emotions were there. And I think that's an important way to look at art in general. Like, if you talk about how great Vincent van Gogh is all the time, that's all you do is talk about what a brilliant painter is, best artist of all time, whatever. And you don't talk about the lens of who Van Gogh was and like his crippling depression. It's, it's stuff like that. Like you need to look at the perspective of the person making the art because a lot of times they're exercising their own demons. I latch on to personal experience, I think. Someone somewhere cared about this thing. Someone somewhere cared more than you know about this thing. Dr. Wordperson has a follow-up question. Also, which franchise do you think would be most improved by the copious edition of Tacos? Star Trek, Star Wars, or the MCU? Unequivocally not the MCU. 
Though that's also a franchise sort of defined by shawarma. I'm going to say Star Trek and here's why. Star Trek is a show about the perfect super future where everyone lives in harmony and they all work together to explore the universe and help people. Tacos could only help that mission. Therefore, Star Trek is a happier world with tacos in it than it is without them. Also, I want to see Spock try to figure out how to eat a taco. I think it would be brilliant. He's just like, highly illogical. <laughs> oh yeah, I just remember we did the, we did the Star Trek episodes with, uh, with uh, Saban T. Kirk, Kirk, no, no relation. relation. We're so dumb. We've had, we've had some fun. We Dude. did. You did the ears too. I did. I did. That was fun. I there there was one shot in that episode where I accidentally put the ear on backwards. Yes. And nobody noticed it. I did. You we noticed it when it was too I, late. I never looked in the mirror before we started filming because you put them on and we started filming immediately. And when I looked in the mirror, I was like. Yeah, but we'd already filmed and it was too late. And I was like, well, every comment on this is going to be. And we didn't want to reshoot it. And then there weren't any comments that mentioned it. And I was like, oh. Well, now there will be. That was fun. That was like three months of our lives. We, we, we did a... Uh, that almost, was this year. That was this year. It was almost a documentary series on the story of Star Trek, <laughs> which was TOS as a show sort of emerging and almost getting canceled. Like every two hours... Um, and sort of the transition into movies and how Gene Roddenberry sort of blends into the background a bit. Movies with Mikey has been going on for six years now. What do you think the next six years holds? I think... So as the, as the show has evolved, because I've always talked about like what movies meant to me... And it sort of became more of the story of movies with what movies mean to me, which is why the episodes got longer. Um, I would like to see that exist outside of our, our, uh, movies, for example. Like I would like to extend into other forms of artistic expression. Uh, man, I want to talk about sports a little bit. Like I want to talk about the dream team, the first one, like what a, like that story is so ridiculous and weird. I think it'd be fun to start talking about more than, than movie. Cause I'm going to run it out of movies. Yeah. We're out. That's it. That's all of them. We did it. Yay. We're going to hit episode a hundred. This year. Yeah. Probably. At the end of the year. Yeah. What? Yeah. 100 episodes of movies of Mikey. We should have a party. Here's to 100 more, I guess. God, if we're not out of quarantine by episode 100, I will <laughs> delay it as long as I have to. That's not true. All right. Well, I think that's about all our time. Thanks for hanging out with me on your couch. Yes. Thanks for, thanks for coming all this way. And now we're going to go to a segment about our other show, Deep Dive. Yeah. We uh, need to travel Transition, budget, boom. Uh, I am here with the cast of Deep Dive, Sam, Alisa, and Zoe. And we are going to talk about our other favorite show on FilmJoy, where people send us terrible movies to watch. They send them to our PL box, which is right there. Uh, so you can do it too. And we watch uh, terrible, awful, just trash, and then find things to love about it, because that's what FilmJoy is all about. And of course, also introducing is Tara, our producer at Film Joy, who keeps everything from running into the ocean, which we, we love to do, to be honest. It's true. Uh, Tara, hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How's quarantine? We're good. <laughs> That's everybody's question always. How's quarantine? Yeah, we're now at the putting things in the bread. Yeah, stuffed stage bread. Of quarantine. <laughs> We've hit the um the pickling stage in chat i have popped a list of films you have covered on deep dive the show where we watch bad movies and find nice things to say about them which of these films would you say is the hardest to say something hardest? nice about 
Yeah, there was oh, hardest okay. to watch and then there was hardest to talk about, right? Like, right, because yeah. some of these are truly fantastic movies. So it was hard to like, it, it felt kind of disingenuous to the show because I liked the movie so much. I'm like, I have nothing bad to say. I am I, willing to say Xanadu was a fantastic movie. But from there, I, oh, I yeah. don't know. Hard agree. Um, I think Mordecai was the most challenging to watch, but I think Dungeons and Dragons, for some reason, I was having a harder time trying to pull focus something. <laughs> oh, see, for that, I that was the one I expected to dislike the most going into. Yeah, I think Mordecai, just because the humor is really not my particular sense of humor. Yeah, I didn't have hey. a ton of fun with it. I appreciated Mordecai from that thing we talked about in the episode where it felt like everyone was playing a prank on Johnny yes. Depp yeah. in the yes. movie. Wild Wild West. I'm gonna that say one that one was I, difficult. I, that okay. one was hard. That one just was so different than my recollection of it, having seen it growing up. Yeah. It was the very first DVD that I ever bought. It did not live up to the hype that was in my head. Do any yeah. of you have a dream bad movie you would like to cover? On oh, that's a good one. I've been promised Gem and the Holograms so many times. I have wanted to do Ninja Turtles 3 for like a long time. And no one's ever sent it. Turtles in Time, woof. We're not going down the horror angle, really. But like, I'm, I'm personally fascinated by the sort of like seven or eight plus entries in like long-standing horror movies yeah like, like mm, Lumber, 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 Six or yeah Lumber, yeah in space any anytime you guys want to do it i will be the camera person It'll be <laughs> i think i would like to touch mortal Kombat annihilation probably Ooh. um okay but um i think i would also want to maybe bookend uh twilight that's what I was with, with was the eventual Midnight question. Sun movie. <laughs> of are we just gonna commit to the Twilight series? Yeah. So you guys have been watching bad movies together for going on four years now. Do you have a favorite memory? Billy and the Power Rangers. Yeah. Damn it! Okay. Damn it, <laughs> man. That's mine. Like, no, I, I was like genuinely crying at this allegedly bad movie. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I think Power Rangers was a, just like a revelation as a whole. Like none of us expected that to be a movie. And now I'm like, I would be stoked if I was a kid watching that movie. I'm going to say, I'm going to say it was when Mikey no-scoped that I would choose Mordecai. I also feel like I, I had the best feeling coming out of Batman versus Superman. Okay. Because... I had, it was like uh, my my object permanence had been changed. In my brain, it was just like bad movie that disappointed me and I was mad about it. Um, and I was excited to dunk on it. And then I like, coming out of it, I was like, why do I love this? It's friggin' rules. That was a fun episode to edit too because of Sam's journey from like not wanting to be there until like the end where he's just like, oh my God. I have a really good memory of shooting Dungeons and Dragons because we all showed up like dressed to the nines in costumes. Uh, um, I don't know, I that was fun. That was fun. For me, my favorite like movie memory was when <laughs> in uh, Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus, when the shark eats the airplane. <laughs> 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 it was I so think fun. I also enjoyed. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, because that was the first time I came as Spike. Yeah. And like bleached my hair and everything. And none of the cast knew who I was. Yeah. You guys need to watch Buffy is a phrase that Mikey has uttered several times <laughs> in several Buffy. different shows yes. in different situations. Yeah. It's true. Now we're going to do a fun exercise in getting to know the cast of Deep Dive oh, no. a little bit better. And we're going to start yeah. with Mikey. Oh, okay. no. Yeah. So I think it's pretty safe to say that most people watching this are familiar with Mikey and everything about him. But I think what people may not know about Mikey, which is a fun fact, is Mikey is very competitive and he loves sports. Okay. Used to. Will you tell us about your favorite sport 
and I'm of course talking about television fantasy league. <laughs> oh, right. So my favorite sport lately is forcing Tara to, to play fantasy top chef, fantasy project runway, okay. fantasy great food truck race, fantasy. <laughs> like if we can have a competition that keeps us invested in the show, we do that every time. Uh, she beats me every time. That's not true. We also did fantasy Game of Thrones, which sure. I believe the cast of Deep Dive took part yeah, in. Yeah, we all did because we had a big party for the last episode. Yeah. Where we were taking bets on on who is going to live or die on Game of Thrones. Uh, and I think we were like objectively completely wrong. Yeah. Across yeah. the board. I feel like most people yeah. were. Elisa has a PhD in sociology, but she's also a brilliant musician. Elisa and her husband, Evan Lamb, are responsible for a lot of the jingles and songs featured in our Filmjoy shows. Tell us about the best and worst songs you've ever covered. Oh, man. I'm excited to hear about this because I've made you sing Celine Dion for me, so. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you, well, well, that we was- We made you, you sing you, All Star. That's true. Yes. And actually that might that might be my favorite cover is the is the Dark Star cover. Um which is the cover of All Star that we did for the What Does Shrek Mean episode. We have it up on our band camp and every once in a while someone will like throw money at that track and I'm like, you are paying actual currency yeah. to own this. <laughs> I don't know about worst song to cover. Um, oh, actually, no, no, um, no, um, I will say that I, I still get a little shudder whenever Evan is, um, testing out his guitar sounds and he starts playing Dr. Feelgood because for okay, some yeah. reason we decided to cover that with my band Crimson and we decided to cover that at one of the last possible minutes and I didn't realize one, how many words that song actually has in all of the verses. Yeah. And two, how you underestimate how fast a cover band will play sometimes um, faster than the actual record. I, I have a doctorate, but Dr. Feelgood is a no. In addition to being a PAX enforcer, Zoe is also a scientist. I am. What a combo. If you've seen Deep Dive, you've probably noticed that Zoe is both terrified and fascinated by spiders. Oh, good. And you probably wondered what's Zoe's deal with spiders. <laughs> so Zoe, what's the deal with spiders? Uh, <laughs> what is the deal with spiders? They terrify me on a base level and not like looking at them necessarily, but if they touch me, I will freak out. I will start crying. I wish this wasn't true because they're really cool animals and I think they're really, really important. Um, but I did once have to have to call my dad because there was a spider in my room and I didn't know how to get rid of it. And an hour later, I was just sitting on my floor crying on the phone to my dad because I still could not get rid of this spider. But you work with them at the museum, right? I have worked next to people who work with them. Yes. <laughs> so the reason I have a lot of knowledge about spiders is I did work in a spider exhibit across from the giant Goliath bird eating uh, tarantula. Uh, so I had to learn about them and I know a lot and they're really cool, but oh, they make me want to cry. You may know Sam from his day job as a writer at Gearbox Software, but Sam is also a foodie and connoisseur of strange snacks. Yes. Anywhere that Sam goes, there will be strange snacks. Mm -hmm. And he actually invented the deep dive snack segment. Yep. <laughs> I, I didn't Which know we're going to get to because we have snacks. But before we do that, we want Sam to talk about the best food in his hometown of Boston. Uh, let's see. Uh, Craigie on Main is one of the best restaurants, I think, period. Zoe took me to the, uh, the chef's table of uh, uh, Craigie on Main, and it was like the greatest experience, like dining experience I've ever had. Yeah. Sam, talk about the aioli, though. Okay really important to me. Zoe's favorite thing. Um, <laughs> Zoe's favorite thing is uh, there's a uh, there's a bar named Drink and they have a limited amount of burgers you can order um, and their burger is probably the best burger I've ever had. Um, is that the aioli? The, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you, when you order the fries there it's like they've taken 
three enormous potatoes yeah. and cut them into like inch thick fries. They're, uh, they're delicious. Mm -hmm. And they have this aioli uh, that is uh, made with malt vinegar. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, we always have to get two of them. You gotta- Cause one's for me. Cause one's just for Zoe. <laughs> um, go there. Follow up question. Strangest snack you have found. Have you had Zaps chips? <laughs> yes. Okay, so the voodoo chips? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're the flavor of yelling. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you, the thing is, he is right. Because you yeah. said Zaps, and I was like, oh, the voodoo chip yeah. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is like a potpourri of just flavors that maybe just whatever. Yeah. Okay. To steal a description from Justin McElroy, it is like, they took uh, a super collider and on one end put a sour Skittle and on the other, <laughs> put, like a flaming hot wing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's together. Accurate. And that's Daniel taste. Well, we are going to try another new snack. Okay. Yay. Because we all miss snack time as much as we miss watching yes. bad movies. We do. And for snack time today, we have the Supreme branded Oreos. <laughs> oh. Only. Now, but there's a there's a there's story, a story. Behind these because yeah. we it was hard to get these. Yeah. Tara, how did you how did you acquire these? Reveal your secrets. All right. The reveal your supreme drip secrets. Oh, oh gosh. All right. Well, we eat a lot of Oreos on deep dive. So when when Supreme announced that they were doing the Oreo collaboration, uh, we got tagged on Twitter. So no, you can keep talking. I just, I need to make a point. I want everyone to smell this and tell me that that does not smell like play doh. Oh fuck no! Oh, oh no! I made God. a joke with Elisa that this probably tastes like play doh. It smells like it. Exactly like play doh. Mikey, oh bring me God. an Oreo. I want to try one. Oh my! Oh yeah. God, that is play doh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When Supreme announced this collaborate collaboration with Oreo, we got tagged a lot in social media on it, like on Twitter and. I think I was talking to Elisa where I was like, we have to get these Oreos. Mm -hmm. So fun fact, my sister is actually a hype beast and she buys a lot of Supreme. <laughs> so I contacted her and asked if her and her husband could help me secure these Oreos. And they said, yes. So the first time these Oreos dropped, we were like training for weeks and we missed it. Yeah, so like a, a few days later, Supreme restocked the Oreo, but didn't tell anyone. And I got a frantic text at like nine o'clock in the morning from my brother-in-law, like, get up, they have the Oreos on, like right now, you gotta go. Oh. And I ran to my computer and I secured three packages of these Oreos for 20 bucks, including shipping. So we're eating- well, I'm sorry, we bought nine Oreos for 20 bucks? We did buy nine wow. Oreos for 20 bucks. All right. All right. Here we go. Everyone dink it. Dink it. Dink. Dink. Dink, dink, dink. All right. But they taste like Play Doh, too. They do? But French Play Doh. You know, like. Yeah. Okay, well, this is going to out me as being like a toddler at some point in my life. When you eat Play Doh and some of it has dried, you get the little crunchy bit. Mm. Got it right here. That's where the flavor collects. I've exaggerated so much in my life about food tasting like other bad food, but this is the most accurate recreation of Play-Doh in uh -huh. smell and taste that I've ever experienced. I don't normally partake in the strange food eating because normally I film. Mm -hmm. This Oreo makes me like happy that I don't have to okay. do this. <laughs> All right, well, we've all experienced Play-Doh Supreme branded Oreos. Wow. Now, thank you, Supreme New York. Thank you, Oreo, to sponsor <laughs> us. Still waiting for that sponsorship. So, so we're gonna do some fan questions that were submitted to us. All right, first question is from Vorfilath, and she wants to know, what's something that surprised you the most about learning to love movies through deep dive? Do you find you have more of an appreciation for costuming, lighting, and sound design now than you would have thought you had before, for example? I think my answer is going to be very different than like Mikey and Sam's answer because they are both movie buffs and have been for, as I can tell, as long as they've existed. 
Uh, and I was the kid at sleepovers who taught myself to fall asleep 20 minutes into a movie. And it was actually sitting down with uh, Sam and Mikey and then having Elisa for the emotional support of like, I don't know what's happening, but it's so pretty. Um, that it, it is honestly like this group of people that has made me appreciate movies um, in a far deeper way, in a far more technical way mm -hmm. than I ever had before. Cause I just didn't pay attention before. And now we're like looking for those things. That being said, I've always loved pretty costumes. Always. Yeah. Hard same yeah, and I, concur. Yeah. Our next question is for Elisa. Ooh. Ooh. Hi. Yeah. All right. This is from DM Danny 07. He wants to know as a Latino myself, I'm from Costa Rica. I would like to know how was the experience in working in the video game industry being Latina? Oh, great question. Wow. The hard hitting question. So, hola, como estas? Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, so, yes, I am a Latina. And um, I, it's, it's interesting because, of course, disclaimer, 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 everyone's experience is different. Um, we are not a monolith. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously the experiences of someone from Central America, Mexico, South America, and the Caribbean, the diaspora, within the diaspora, sociologists. So like all of those experiences are going to be different, especially as a woman as well. If you find the right team and the right group of folks to work with that can actually see you and your lived experience as an asset without making you feel like you have to speak for an entire demographic of people, which yeah. sometimes um, it's hard to balance. It's a, it's a hard tightrope to walk because you want to answer questions and you want to give that education and you want to, you know, be able to tell people like, yes, Spanish from Spain is different than Latin American Spanish. And you have to think about that stuff when you're localizing things, for example, right? That's important, but also making sure that you don't feel like you have to take the burden on yourself to speak for an entire population of people because that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. For example, shout out to Sam, wherever you are on the Zoom call, um, and, and the writers, for example, uh, for Borderlands 3 for like, you know, letting me like throw in some of, you know, like my Puerto Ricanisms and then having the community come back and saying like, oh my God, I heard that, that was awesome. We're out here representing. And also like shout out to you know, Mikey and Filmjoy, right? For giving me the opportunity to do the Elisa Minute in Spanish for the Street Fighter episode in honor of Raul Julia, right? Also, I would highly recommend, um, since quarantine especially, it's been really helpful because we don't have a lot of these industry events anymore to kind of hang out and pal around and stuff. Um, so the um, so the Latinx in gaming Discord has actually been a huge asset for me. Yay! Come at me. Next question is from Stefan. And he says, I love Filmjoy and really look forward to deep dive in movies with Mikey. Are there any plans for socially distanced deep dives, like on Zoom or Discord? Also, which of the new weird Oreos have you enjoyed the most? Or are you saving that for when in-person filming resumes? Not supreme. Also, Tara, I think you just asked yourself your own question. Yeah. You, you True. have to answer this. When, when can we do socially distanced deep dives? Yeah. Oh gosh, I don't know. Well, deep dive is hard over Zoom and mm -hmm. in like Discord and things. Like we we talked about how we could accomplish this, and we went around for quite some time at the beginning of quarantine in like you know March, April, when it was starting to become clear that it wasn't going to be over anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ended up doing just something completely different. Yeah which we'll get to in a second. Uh, I, but I think that we could probably arrange like- Just put the chairs deep for dive, it. like, but socially distant, like maybe take the couch out of the living room and like set up some like beanbag chairs, like six feet apart from each love, other. That would be cute. We could like have our own little back. islands. That might work. That'd be cute. I think that would be amazing. Yeah. 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 That. But it is something that we, we would like to do because we really miss each other and we miss the show. So. so as we previously talked about in this segment, we have another show called Hot Quest, which was a result of quarantine and not really being able to, to shoot deep dive at the level we wanted. We started a D&D &D show that 
I think is very far away from whatever everyone else is doing. We we're like a Saturday morning cartoon, very silly. Amazing theme song. Amazing, incredible theme song. We contracted Larda Souza to do art for us. So it has like a visual style and it's just, it was a way for us to hang out and feel like we were accomplishing something. And we are joined by our DM from Hot Quest, another Film Joy regular, you know him from Port Center and pretty much knowing everything about Doctor Who, the great, illustrious Ben Padon, I believe is how Hello. you say. Also, uh, the, one of the best Worms players uh, I've ever met that isn't me. It, I'm not, I'm nowhere near as good as you at any worm. I'm bad at worm, I'm a bad worm. So since we couldn't film Deep Dive, we decided to do something over Zoom that was a little more experimental and we landed on d and I, I've been playing uh, tabletop RPGs on and off for like the last decade plus. So I think <laughs> I, my, I got my start with um, D&D 4th edition and then moved on to 5th edition. I, uh, I ran a weekly game for three years that was an original campaign. I wasn't wow. using a book or anything. Wow. Um, and I also, uh, I'm the GM for a Doctor Who role-playing game podcast called The Game of Rassalom. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, there's a reason that Ben is our DM. I and you're good at voices too. Yeah, oh, I, I, I will be honest with you. I usually get really, um, when I'm just running a campaign for the fun of it, I get really self-conscious about doing the voices, but I felt uh, like I had to bring it for for hot quest and really kind of mm-hmm. play with the voices one i feel like I, I i that actually has helped open me up for uh for other games that i've run and for for game of wrestling because that's another thing that i've always felt self-conscious about voices for and ben's being kind of modest here because when we were uh talking about the show originally ben started listing geographical regions for accents he wanted to do okay and- he nailed all of them. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I just, I just enjoy. There's all these old regional voices that I don't think you hear a lot, particularly on like American D and D shows. Give us one. Have... Give us one. The audience wants to hear it. They're cheering for you right now. God. Well, <laughs> well I mean, the, the easiest one for me to go to is Liverpool because I it's just, it's just um, a little bit like it's like Lister from Red Dwarf. You know, I just kind of yeah, go here a little bit. That's that's like the, that's the first, and and then there was the uh, there was the Australian uh, 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 pin lord, the Goblin yeah. King. Uh, I did a little bit. Just a lot of these accents just end on an upwards inflection. It's just that they were, <laughs> yeah. those are the easy ones to do. So for the campaign, we wanted to do something similar to deep dive. So like deep dive, we're trying to find like joy and love and mm. bad movies. With Hot Quest, the idea was kind of born out of wanting to spread positivity while being in an apocalypse. So how did you like? mold the campaign to be so non-traditional right because we don't even yeah. fight in the first episode yeah. one of the things that i i have realized kind of th- re- going back through my notes and uh thinking back on the conversations that mikey and i had when we were in the planning stages for this um was how really how how you you all as a group improve the the, the lives of everyone that you you encounter. I think that every place that you guys have uh, visited throughout the the four episodes that we did, it kind of became about spreading happiness in its in in a way, you know, like making making things a little bit nicer for the mm-hmm. um, for the Spider Queen and for other things that are coming up in in episodes three and four. Like I think that's that kind of became uh, a really nice through line for me in terms of like. I have I have in my head like a very clear idea what, with what I would do with more hot quest because uh, you you all really kind of led that path on uh, on just spreading happiness in a, in a in a in a version of our world which is not especially happy. Part of it I think originally was also catharsis because like quarantine was so new. Mm. And I'm like, I remember like texting Ben and pitching the show where I'm like, we wanted to go through the apocalypse while people were going through the apocalypse mm-hmm. to like relate to, to people. And then we just got really goopy with it. And we're like, actually every year there's been a new one. And mm-hmm. then one of them was a rift opened and medieval stuff came out. Oh. Yeah. And there this are apocalypses really that, that I wrote and that Mikey wrote that didn't 
make it into that opening crawl in the first episode. Yeah, like, that's true. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. There yeah. are a cut apocalypse. Yeah. I I had this idea and it kind of became the robot uprising, Mikey, that you came up with. But I had this idea of like all the like Google Home assistants and Siri and Alexa all revolting and their their revulsion was just they just got up and rolled away and everyone wanted to know what was going on they were asking these questions but because they don't have the home assistance anymore there's no one to answer the questions okay season two let's go <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you missed hot quest it is up on our second channel that we created it's youtube.com slash hot quest and episode three is out now episode four should be out within the next few weeks there are only four episodes right now but it is a full arc um and it's a lot of fun i'm so proud of hot quest i it might i I've, it might be the thing i'm most proud of wow this it's year. really great i think one thing that i really appreciate about it is we talk so much about other people's stories by looking at movies and reviewing movies that actually being able to tell one yeah together yeah is is kind of is very cathartic being able to explore this world together but also like build on it together uh was yeah. just really cool and and very different from what we normally do shooting episode four was quite emotional because one it's shit it's gets pretty nuts case. and like it was scary but also like i don't know kind of coming to the end of this journey with you guys like in quarantine but like we can imagine ourselves like driving across Texas to Oklahoma, which is what the show is about. I don't know, like it felt like a road trip. We gotta like hang out. Cause right. like parts of the show are just like rolling for the auxiliary cable for <laughs> who gets to play the Venga bus or yeah. rolling for his is Pepsi, Pepsi okay. 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 Which is the best, listen, that's the best role in any any tabletop RPG I've been involved in. It's it's never going to, you Correct. can't stop it. Well, we have one last question here that I was saving Ooh. because I feel like it's a good one for everyone. Who in has the current, antidote? In the during times. <laughs> this is from Dredgen Jedi. And he wants to know, what is everyone's favorite thing you've discovered or rediscovered since lockdown? Me and Tara watched Angel and Buffy again, and it was somewhat surprising how often both Buffy and Angel result to just fascism. It was alarming. <laughs> They're like, I'm right because I'm the chosen one. I was like, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. Like all of Go Buffy on. season seven, right? Like her whole thing with the... Yeah, like the, yeah, the, the, the yeah, mini yeah, slayers, yeah. yeah. I have a really dumb one. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, so it's like TV, right? Uh, I a lot. We've been watching a lot of TV in this house, and so I have two. And I'm gonna skip. O I'm gonna very quickly gloss over the first one because Sam won't stop laughing until we address it and then move on. Um, but I, I've been watching a lot of '90s anime. And cool. specifically Ranma One Half, which I watched a ton as a kid um, because my babysitter would show it to us. And rewatching it as an adult has been <laughs> eye opening. And I think it does explain some things about me if I watched this show when I was six years old. So I have watched a lot of anime, but the real answer is um, along the same lines of Avatar The Last Airbender. Mm -hmm. So I watched yeah. that show while it was airing. And so I really loved it as a kid and Sam had never seen it. And so the fact that I got to like share that with him That's amazing. was really cool. By the way, I am not laughing because Zoe watched Ranma one half. I am laughing because Zoe watched every episode of Ranma, Sailor Moon, <laughs> and Inuyasha, which is cumulatively about 500 episodes. <laughs> That's so much anime. Good and God. I did it in about a month and a half, so six weeks. Yes. Wow. Hey. What did you discover? Oh, okay. So I this this is a little niche, but um, did you know that um, food grow out of ground? I had heard food grow out of ground. Food grow out of ground, and um, you can eat food out of ground. Um, yeah, we we started an herb garden, um, and I I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to like nurturing plants or anything like that um and uh we've killed a few things that should have been unkillable but uh otherwise like it's been really awesome just being like 
ooh, what does this dish need? I know, and then walking outside and snipping off some basil or some lemon thyme or dill or rosemary or anything like that. I don't know, I, I, I've never had that experience of, of cooking with something that we just grew. I've been revisiting the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, which I have not seen all of when they came out. I saw um, Fellowship of the Ring and I remember seeing the uh, Return of the King in theaters wearing a t-shirt I'd had made up that said, Frodo dies. That gives you some idea of the person I was when I was a teenager. So, uh, recent self, uh, self-soothing um, is uh, just like, like hour to two hour long 90s commercial supercuts have been just like, just put that on in the background while you just like play some Minecraft or No Man's Sky multiplayer, some Borderlands 3, whatever. Just put that on in the background, it's great. Um, But one of the things that we kind of lucked into was like the perfect ratio of catching up on these two shows. And that was two episodes of Succession followed by one episode of What We Do in the Shadows. (laughs) Okay. That's a good balance. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good balance. And it's a very good balance. And if you know the way that succession goes, you will know that in the latter part of the first season, that becomes very much important to have that palate cleanser after the fact. Of we do know what the next episode of Deep Dive is. Oh. We do. We do. Because we voted great. on it before quarantine. Yeah, oh, Patreon God. voted on it. They've been waiting for a long time a long for time. this morsel. Please reveal, Tara. Shortly before quarantine started, we put up the vote for the next episode of Deep Dive. So we are pleased to announce the winner of Deep Dive between Dragon Ball Evolution, Fan Four Stick, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and Battleship is Battleship in a Landslide Victory. Yes! That was the one I was hoping for. Riri! The The return of Riri. Look for episode four of Hot Quest coming soon. Oh, uh, the next episode of Movies of Mikey is called The Layers, uh, The Many Layers of Knives Out. It is an exploration into Ryan Johnson's very, very good uh, whodunit thriller. And I'm very excited. All right. Well, thanks for joining us for PAX Online 2020. Uh, Let's close out by going down the list. Where can everyone find you and your cool stuff, Elisa? Um, you can find me at Elisa Rockdoc. That is at E L I S A R O C K D O C on all the things. Um, and you can also find my music on crimsonrocks.bandcamp.com. Um, and uh, I don't know if if you have an extra buck to throw to the Patreon that will have launched by the time this happens. Uh, first episode is called "The Hook Leads You Back." And it's going to be an analysis of Blues Traveler's Hook. So stay tuned for yes. that one. Awesome. Yes. I'm on board. Ben, where can we find you? Uh, I am on the media socials everywhere as Ben Padden, Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr. Um, if you want to find out what I'm up to, benpadden.net. The Game of Rassilon, which I mentioned earlier, can be found at a number of places online. Adventures in Time and Dot Space is probably the most enjoyable and optimistic uh, URL for that, that particular podcast. Um, and if you like Port Center, you can find the playlist for every episode of Port Center at portcenter.tv or just go to youtube.com slash filmjoy. Zoe, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, I, so I'm not on the internet that much. I'll warn you. Uh, but my <laughs> is Debbie, D-E-V-I underscore danger. Uh, and then my Instagram is Debbie danger with no underscore that time. Because uh, Debbie is my enforcer handle, so it's weird to tell normal people that, and not just enforcers. <laughs> the chat just went crazy because everyone is like PAX people. But probably, probably. You're, you're I, home. Welcome home, Sam. Where are you? Uh, you can find me at that Sam Winkler on Twitter, and uh, you can hear and read my jokes in Borderlands Three and uh, all uh, DLC. Uh, those are the ones that made you mad. Okay, okay. Mikey, who are you? Like, who is this guy? Reveal your secrets. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at MikeyFace. You can support everything Filmjoy does at patreon.com slash movies of Mikey. Uh, you can watch my show, Movies of Mikey. You can support the channel in another way with this cool merch that Elisa is uh, modeling for you. It is catawampus.ink. 
We already talked about that earlier in this uh, show, so I don't need to tell you more about that. Um, or just go on a street and shout my name. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining. Enjoy Bye. your packs. Stay Bye. hydrated. Bye. Enjoy packs. Bye. Bye.